Welcome to Northern BC Moments. It's a chance for us to look back at some of the more heartwarming and memorable stories of 2018. And we'll start with the wildfires. While it was another unprecedented season in BC, it was stressful and scary for evacuees, but it was also a time for them to come together. Prince George housed 1,300 evacuees at one point, and they did what they could to keep their minds off of what they were leaving behind. 90 years I stay in Centre BC, I never move. <laughs> it was a birthday party unlike anything else, set up in the parking lot of the North Star Inn, where many evacuees are being housed. People of all ages, dancing, singing and drumming. To celebrate the 90th birthday of William Joseph, an elder from Yakuchi First Nation. We were honoring our oldest elder of Yakuchi First Nation that turned 90 years old today. And we're honoring him because not very much people these days are that old these days, especially in our community, we're so small. The small remote community of Yakuchi was evacuated Sunday night due to the wildfires. It's about a four hour drive from Prince George. The celebration provided some healing for members of the First Nation. We're stressing out for because of what we have in our smokehouse, our livestock, everything might be spoiling. And our houses might be going because we're way out in the boonies where the Summer Lakes fire is. That's where we are. And yeah, this is helping me a lot. But it was more than just members of the Yakuchi First Nation. The birthday party was an opportunity for evacuees from different First Nations to come together and celebrate a milestone while showing solidarity for one another. With the fires going on, the fire situation, there's so many people from our, our, our way out west that have come to Prince George as evacuees and uh, it's been really tough. A lot of anxiety going on. There's, um, it's really hard for people to be away from the territories. Uh, we're in the middle of fishing season. People left their smokehouses. People left their tr traditional ways of life and to be here and uh, it's, it's really tough. So us banding together is just a really, um, just a way to look each other up and try to keep positive. As William Joseph blows out his candles for his 90th birthday, it's one he won't soon forget as hundreds of people displaced by fire take a moment to sing despite what's happening at home. I still love them with all my heart. Kendall Robertson, CKPG News. Meanwhile, the wedding of a lifetime quickly turned to plan B for one Prince George couple due to the largest wildfire burning in the province at that time, the Shovel Lake Fire. Catherine Hansen has more on how the generosity of the community helped to make their wedding go off without a hitch. This one will be really That's good. That's a good one, yeah. Newlywed Kelsey Siemens and her mom Lisa Horsnell relive her big day. What was supposed to be Kelsey's dream wedding this weekend at the family cabin on the north side of Fraser Lake quickly changed after the family was forced out by the Shovel Lake wildfire. I've been planning this wedding for longer than we've been engaged, but um, mainly for over a year now I've been planning it for the cabin. So um, once we found out it couldn't be there, I had no idea what to even expect because everything was planned around the cabin. Just five days before the weekend wedding came word the family cabin was on alert and would soon be put on an evacuation order. It was search and rescue that actually came down and said you're on evacuation alert and our road to the cabin, the police were set up right at our road. So past that was evacuation order are up to our road, um, it was alert. And he said within 24 hours, you're gonna get evacuated. With almost 200 guests expecting for a wedding weekend of camping and celebration and just a few days to go, Kelsey and groom Tyler oh, yeah. didn't want to cancel. Offers of help poured in, including the use of a private hangar at the Vanderhoof Airport. I was really nervous. I had never even really been in an aircraft hangar, so I didn't know what to expect. But once we showed up, I felt so much better, so much relief that it, everyone could still camp there. We could have everything inside, which was really nice because of the smoke as well. Kelsey and Tyler tied the knot on Saturday at Riverside Park in Vanderhoof, still in front of the water as planned, and then danced the night away at the decorated hangar. In the end, the bride says she wouldn't have changed a thing. It's a long time coming, but I'm so relieved, and the party was great. I'm finally married to my hubby, so it's all good. <laughs> to give up your dream of your wedding and go to a different venue it wasn't you know wasn't the way we planned but look it was beautiful 
The Horsnell family cabin remains under evacuation order. As far as Lisa knows, it is still untouched by the massive wildfire. Katherine Hansen, CKPG News. The Rocky Mountain Rangers marched to City Hall earlier this year to receive the freedom of the city. It's the highest award council can bestow upon a citizen or an organization, and they voted unanimously to award the Rangers with the honor. The Rocky Mountain Rangers marched through the city Saturday. It's very symbolic, uh, but, uh, but the ceremony has not really changed in six or seven hundred years. It's, it's still the same thing before troops can be allowed to come in, in the city. Uh, we, we need to get the permission through the Freedom of City. The Rangers march ended at City Hall where, as per tradition, the commander requested an audience with the mayor. After inspecting the troops, the mayor bestowed the award. Freedom of the city is not given out very often. We don't have many over the years that have received it. Uh, so to be able to give it to the regiment really signifies how important they are to our community. The commander of the Canadian Army was also in attendance. Lieutenant General Paul Winnick pointed out that it is somewhat unique for a city to bestow the award onto a group of people like the Rocky Mountain Rangers. It's rare. It, it is a real mark of respect uh, from a community to a community's regiment. And in the case of the Rocky Mountain Rangers, that truly is Prince George's uh, regiment. There is no Canadian Armed for other Canadian Armed Forces unit in Prince George. So that is truly Prince George's own. With the freedom of the city, the Rangers now have the right to parade through Prince George, flags flying, drums beating. Ashley Burr, CKPG News. An act of kindness caught the eye of many just outside Ron Brent Elementary School after a community library was burnt to the ground just before summer began. It may have been a small bookshelf, but it touched a lot of people. Book after book has been placed in this new community library, a spot for anyone to drop by and exchange books. Just days after the old library was burnt to the ground, a local contractor, Derek Andrews, spent a few summer evenings rebuilding it. Andrew had lived in the neighborhood for years and couldn't stand the thought of where he grew up being labeled as a bad area. Yeah, there's a lot of people speaking about, you know, the, the bad neighborhood, the bad kids, you know, bad parenting, all that kind of stuff. And myself growing up in the neighborhood, uh, as well as attending the school, I kind of thought I could take away from that stigma by, you know, putting my part in rebuilding it. Although school was out when the library was being put back up, it managed to build a stronger school community during the summer months. School District 57 was beyond grateful for what Andrew did, and not just for the neighbourhood, but for Rob Brent Elementary as well. Just a, a big thank you to Derek and B3 Construction uh, and to you know, his partners who, who came together uh, and rebuilt that library. You know, it, was, it was less than two weeks ago that, that it burned down, uh, and the fact that it was uh, rebuilt restocked. Uh, just, a, just a huge thank you to everyone uh, on behalf of the school district for making this possible. The story of the fire and the rebuild will now be a part of Ron Brent's history and will be talked about when school returns in the fall. Teachers can now use it as a lesson to show that when something bad happens, Prince George comes together as a community to support one another. I think it shows a lot that, you know, the community is strong and that, you know, we are here when something bad happens. Um, my biggest reason for putting it up, of course, was children. You know, the children were pretty excited about it when they were putting the books in. Um, I have already brought my children by. They were pretty excited about it, you know, checking out, stuff like that. The Little Library is now open and ready to once again become a part of the welcoming community. Olivia McDonald, CKPG News. Coming up next on Northern BC Moments, we did say goodbye to a few local business people, but we also celebrated some milestones. While 2018 did see record-breaking growth in the city, we did say goodbye to a few local business owners who moved on to new endeavors. McKinnis Lighting opened in 1920 as a building supply store and it operated in the same location by the same family for nearly 100 years. Earlier this year, the grandson of the original owner retired to spend more time with his family. For over 50 years, Paul Williams has been working under the lights of the McGinnis Lighting Store. At the end of the month, he and his wife Joan will retire from the second oldest retail business in the city. 
Well, it's one of those things. You get to retirement age and you start looking around at the world around you and, and uh, the wonderful things that have happened to you and our children and our grandchildren and start thinking about spending more time with them. And, uh, you know, when an opportunity comes your way, you look at it seriously and uh, we've decided to uh, go to the next chapter of our lives. The McGinnis Building has been part of the downtown landscape since William's grandfather built it over two city blocks in 1920. And when it became difficult to do building supplies in a, in a bustling downtown, you can imagine semis coming in and trying to unload. We moved to a First Avenue location while still keeping this open with electrical, hardware, plumbing, that sort of thing, and the heavy building materials at our First Avenue location. For what name would it be under? Williams attributes the success of the almost one century old business to sticking to family values. I believe your staff and, and your customer base are, are like family and you really spend more time with your co-workers and your, the, the people that you deal with in a business than you do your family in some ways and uh, boy you better enjoy that and, and we certainly have. During retirement, Paul and his wife plan to step away from the limelight and see more of their family. The current staff will be joining the new owners at a new location. We feel very humbled by the support we've uh, received here over the years. Prince George is an amazing community. We always say to people, especially new people coming in, the, our Prince George's greatest strength is, is its people. And uh, they've been very kind to, to us over the years and we have a deep appreciation for that. Dave Branco, CKPG News. A local restaurant shut its doors. That was a key place for local performers to showcase their music. For five years, Shiraz was a place for Persian food and live entertainment. Sina, uh, this picture is university. Of course, most of this picture on the wall were from people from university because that was my second home the entire time. And Shiraz owner Reza Akbari and his wife Nargis Jamali pulled treasured photos from the wall. Not long ago, this Persian eatery was full of food and music, but a rise in rent and food costs were too much for the owners. Mainly the overhead cost, what we call it in the industry, is uh, the overhead cost is keep going up, up, and it get to the point that it was not justifiable at all into the industry. The award-winning restaurant was not only known for its food, but for its stage. Over the past five years, 286 performers made music, ranging from those starting out to the internationally acclaimed. Even the whole stage was meaningful for me. I brought um, uh, a car handcrafted carpet that is 120 years old, and I put in that stage. I wanted a Persian carpet that I wanted every musician goes there, regardless of what their background is, stays in a something uh, artistic represented of uh, my heritage. The loss of Shiraz is a huge loss for the local music community. Members are already looking for new places to perform. As far as these like restaurant gigs that offer the beginning musician or or someone who doesn't have a full band or a really big following. It offers them a space to practice in and to hone their craft. And that's a serious loss, to not have a space that offers that. Finding a place for local music is also a mandate of the city, as it works to bring a greater arts and cultural presence to the downtown area. The restaurant Shiraz really did, in fact, embody the multiculturalism of our community. And there was an opportunity for uh, many musicians uh, to go in and and uh, really uh, give Prince George an indication of what we're about culturally when it comes to music. And losing that is, uh, is, is, is truly a hit for the city. For Akbari, the music has stopped for now, a decision that wasn't made lightly. Success has many different meanings. For me, it was always about making a positive impact on people's life, and I think we did it. Catherine Hansen, CKPG News. After more than 30 years in the business, a local bakery closed its doors for the last time this summer. Not because of a lack of dough, but to mark a new chapter in the owners' lives. As the very last batch of bread goes into the oven, Monica and Roman Muntiner say goodbye to the Red Rooster Bakery. We enjoyed having uh, all, all the, the customers. They, they loved it. And, and so we, yeah, sort of, it's, it's a bit sad, but you know, the, you, you just know when it's time to, to take it easier, yeah. 
The decision to close the bakery came not only because the couple is looking to retire, but because Monica is getting a knee replacement surgery this week, which finalized the closing date for Red Rooster. My passion is my, uh, baking bread. I love it. I still do. But the, we have to take uh, life a little bit easier now. The, the joints are giving out. Like that. And then we go over here. The couple moved to Prince George from Switzerland in 1986 and brought with them the age-old art of bread making. We were used to real bread. So uh, Monica started baking her own bread and uh, there was no farmer's market. We decided let's start the farmer's market. Uh, so with a handful of uh, other foolhardy people, we started the farmer's market 23 years ago, I think it was. At their home in Mud River, they built a traditional wood-fired masonry oven, which fueled their love of the craft. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like Red Rooster's legacy will be passed on. Bakeries are hard to pass on because it is a lot of work and uh, no one wants to do that work. As the last crumbs fall on their final batch of bread, the couple closes the doors on their labor of love and take a new path. Ashley Burr, CKPG News. It wasn't all goodbyes this year though. A significant change was made at the Immigrant and Multicultural Society to honor a woman who's touched the hearts of many in our community. I want to thank you, Belgi. You've made a difference in my life and the life of so many people. The room lit up as Belgi Sethi stood to accept both a Lifetime Achievement Award and the honor of having the Immigrant and Multicultural Service Society building named after her. The Baljeet Sethi Center will now carry her legacy through its name and its ongoing achievements. After retiring back in March, Sethi says she has many good memories and was grateful for what the IMSS did for her. Immigrant services gave me all this opportunity and all, I always feel that it has a very special place in my heart because they made me a person that is, is a, a, maybe so many things that in my heart that I wanted to do but I had no uh, opportunity to do. Many people from Prince George stood to speak on Sethi's behalf and nothing but kind words were said. It was clear she had quite the impact on this community. She has done an amazing job actually. She is the one who is the founder of this organization, not only that, but also she has uh, the, put her whole life for the immigrants to helping them. And he, she promoted multiculturalism in the, in the province itself. And she was honored with all over the northern BC, all BC again and all over Canada too. Many would consider themselves lucky to really enjoy what they do for a living, and Sethi was one of those people. The work she did gave her a great amount of joy and allowed her to do things she never imagined were possible. I personally loved my job. It was, I never did just my job because this was my, my yes. most emotional thing that it was satisfaction for my, my mind because this is what I wanted to do, to help people. The celebrations didn't stop after the new name was revealed. A day of culture continued over at the Columbus Community Hall with unique food and entertainment from around the world. Olivia McDonald, CKPG News. Coming up next on Northern BC Moments, a local high school celebrates a milestone and a new exhibit makes its way to the exploration place. Prince George Secondary School celebrated half a century this year. It opened its doors for the first time February 1st, 1968. A lot has happened since then, but some say it still feels like yesterday. It's a really neat history from our school. Half a century went by in the blink of an eye for some, many remembering a chilly day as more than 1,000 students marched from the old Duchess Park to a brand new school, PGSS. The Prince George Citizen calling it the Great Trek. It was um, it was really exciting. Everybody was just really you know pumped and it was fun and it was cold and um, yeah it was uh, um, I don't know I was really looking forward to seeing the new school but we were going to really miss the old school too that whole area you know. 
The school was state-of-the-art, costing about $4.5 million to complete. Had that school been built in 2017, it would have cost at least $30.6 million. I just loved it. I loved all the windows and the woodwork. and Yeah, pretty exciting compared to our old school, that's for sure. You know, everybody, everybody was excited. It was pretty crazy that day. Students, and uh, here some of the, the clubs and the... PGSS boasted many clubs and teams in 1968, from basketball to bridge club, even bowling and secretarial practice club, which was made up of 17 girls who improved on their qualifications for office work. While PGSS no longer has that club, current staff say it continues to offer all kinds of programming. I'm really very familiar with the programs and the offerings we have for students, and I, and I find that it's a progressive school, it's a terrific staff, um, they're kid-centered. Students and staff celebrated the milestone anniversary with cake and decorations. And while he's been at PGSS for a handful of years, it's a day Manhas won't soon forget as it's his first official day as principal. I'm thrilled to be the principal here. Um, I love the school, I love the staff. Um, I have a strong connection to the place. And, um, and, and you know, polar country's awesome. <laughs> As PGSS rings in half a century, many still feel polar pride like it was 1968. Kendall Robertson, CKPG News. The Exploration Place and UMBC mark Terry Fox's remarkable Marathon of Hope with a detailed exhibit on his journey. Staff say it was a hit with school kids. The only limitations you have are self-imposed. You can do anything just like Terry Fox did. It was one of the most comprehensive exhibits ever organized on Terry Fox's legacy and it's set up for its final stop of the tour in Prince George. The display includes artifacts like Fox's artificial leg, clothes and journal. It took many hours of planning and preparation, but now that it's ready, those who helped get it here say it's all worth it. It's just elation, listening to the kids that are in here already today from Ron Brent and the joy I'm hearing in their voices. For me this morning when we first turned it on and it was quiet, I could hear the sound of Terry running, that ka-chunk, ka-chunk kind of noise, and it just it gave me chills. It took me back to my youth in Ontario and, and to all of the stories you've ever heard about Terry. It's a powerful exhibit. It was back in 1979 when Fox was in Prince George running what's now called the Labor Day Classic. He may have finished dead last, but the fact that he was able to finish pushed him to officially announce his plans on running the Marathon of Hope. Eight months later, he set off on his journey. Uh, he was a pain in the butt. I mean, he was like any, any brother, right? He wasn't, he wasn't perfect. He'd be the first to admit that. Uh, but uh, what I remember most about Terry was that he was extremely driven. He wasn't a great student. He was not a good athlete. But he never gave up. He always tried his very best. And I think that's a very important message to, to share with future generations, which is what we do. The exhibit gives an in-depth look at Fox's epic 143-day, 5,000-kilometer journey from St. John's, Newfoundland to Thunder Bay, Ontario. Located at the University of Northern British Columbia is where the second part of the exhibit is on display, the iconic Marathon of Hope van. What we notice is how emotionally people are attached to Terry Fox. Uh, those who actually have seen him when he was doing his Marathon of Hope in 1980, and, and, and those who actually have never seen him uh, because they're too young, but actually have heard about it and have, have been taught about it. And so uh, it's an amazing experience altogether. The official opening to the public will take place this evening that will include a ribbon cutting, speeches and an overview of the exhibit. It will be on display in Prince George until January 13th, 2019. Olivia McDonald, CKPG News. Also a hit with the kids was this unique lesson plan taught by a local elementary school teacher. He combined music with Canadian history and wrote it into a song so his students could learn. Grade 3 and 4 teacher David Schulte enjoys playing music for his students. Over the last several years he took the Canadian history curriculum from a textbook and transformed it into a musical. You've got all these things going on where they're they're singing about history, and, but they're not just singing, standing rigidly still. They're, they're, there's often some action and they're telling a story behind the song. And it's the capitals of Canada that I like best. Schulte admits it's a bit of a challenge to teach a group of elementary students a musical, but he has seen positive results. I'm amazed at how, the, yeah, like I, I don't think I could repeat the provinces and provincial cities, like let alone sing it and we start to run through it pretty fast and it's just like they've, they've got it, it's ingrained in their bodies and uh, 
in their heads. So yeah, they, but they also love the song. I think that's part of it. They love the songs and pretty easy because we started at the beginning of the year this song, so we and it was quick and easy to learn. Schulte says some of his students prefer learning through song. It makes me happy that they're acting out the Battle of the Plains of Abraham and the English army led by General Wolfe. Um, and he, um, he won the war. So, and then the official language is now English. Schulte says sometimes years later, students from the past come up to him recalling the musicals he's taught them. It's often a point of they remember the musicals we've done and even the kids here who I've done musicals with, they, they remember the parts and they remember the, what the story was about. The Dave Branco, CKPG News. From Canadian history to Terry Fox and gardening, local kids were treated to a number of fun ways to learn this year. And there's nothing better than playing in some warm soil when the snow is still on the ground. And that's exactly what 20 kids did earlier this year, planting seeds for future gardeners. They say many hands make for short work, and there were many little hands working very hard this morning at Art Knapp's Plantland. These tots are planting different kinds of vegetables like corn and squash and a couple of varieties of flowers like nasturtiums. What better way to break the springtime blahs? Well, spring break first off, and since it's snowing outside, the kids don't have too much to do out there, so we're going to bring them inside and educate them on how to seed. But some of these kids are no strangers to the science of how to seed. We have grown uh, um, purple and green beans, and we have, have grown... I uh, think carrots, and they're, they were kind of rainbow carrots, they were different colors and stuff. This is the first time Lorena Van Hegg has hosted this seminar and there have been a few surprises. Kids love it. They love getting their hands dirty. They love, a lot of kids love like veggies, which was really surprising. They all like them all, except for Brussels sprouts was the only thing the kids don't like, but they love it. They love getting their hands dirty. They love planting the seeds and then eventually watching them grow, right? So it's that satisfaction. <laughs> and that's exactly what Charlie's mom thinks. I think it's really important to know uh, where food comes from and, and how it's grown. Yeah, and I, I think he eats his vegetables much better when we grow them ourselves. Yeah because he helps me grow them and then we harvest them and then he helps cut them and then he's more excited to eat them, right? So While others are here for the dirt on the hands aspect of planting seeds. I like to watch him look. All right. It's a great way to spend a morning, a win-win for everyone. It's something to do that for him and I that doesn't cost an arm and a leg and it's productive. But in the end, Art Knapps has its own ulterior motive. Creating future gardeners is never a bad thing. We want kids to know where their food's coming from and being able to watch it grow and then this will grow with them, right? So now in 20 years, they're going to be able to be like, yeah, we know how to garden because we learned when we were eight years old at Art Naps, right? By the time summer arrives, these kids will have a head start on the season. Cheryl Jan, CKPG News. Hunting for lost treasures may seem like something out of a movie, but it's a reality for one local resident. He's been searching for buried treasures underground for years, and his hobby has paid off. This is how you'd find Matt Dirksen on a regular day. Metal detector in hand, carefully scanning every inch of ground, hoping to find a buried treasure. He says he spends about three hours a day searching, a hobby that goes hand in hand with his passion for local history. I got into it when I was about 11 years old. I picked up a metal detector from Canadian Tire and uh, I went out my schoolyard the next day and started finding rings and old coins and whatnot, right? So I was hooked from the beginning. Dirksen estimates he's found more than $500 in change and has found a number of jewels and gems worth a pretty penny. I found what's hanging around my neck. This is a 1906 American half dollar. I found this sitting on the Fraser River, just in, in the rocks, in between the rocks and the gravel. Um, I found the chain separately in a uh, high school field. And uh, I found all sorts of silver coins, like a couple handfuls, like a couple hundred old silver coins and rings, about a dozen gold rings and diamonds and whatnot. But it's not the money that keeps them going, it's finding and returning treasures to their owners. 
something he's done a handful of times, including this ring he found in the Miller edition that was lost sometime in the 50s. And he did that by using social media. And I got goosebumps. I looked at this picture and thought, oh my gosh, those are my initials. And I'm, I know that I, I'm connected to that ring. Jane Snyder got in contact with Dirksen through Facebook and will soon have the ring in her possession after being without it for nearly 60 years. I figured since it had the initials and I found it in a specific yard, then I might be able to find the owner. And I go by a code. If I can find the owner, I will try. If there's any identifying marks that could lead me to find an owner, I will always attempt to. Dirksen has a Facebook page called Caribou Jewelry Recovery, where he hopes to share more found jewelry and help to dig up pieces of the past. Kendall Robertson, CKPG News. Coming up next on Northern BC Moments, we hear from more influential artists, athletes, and interesting people from Prince George. Each year, more than 700 BC residents suffer life-altering burns. The BC Professional Firefighters Burn Fund aims to raise money for those survivors. One local woman is sharing her story with the hopes it will raise awareness. Debbie Wood is a recognizable face at this local paint store. With a cheerful attitude, she's a hard worker and a people person. At the age of two, Debbie suffered third degree burns over 95% of her body. Her mom was pregnant and had German measles at the time. She was quite ill. I wanted to bake a cake for my dad and my sister. Uh, my mom said, let's go and have a nap and we'll get up in time to make sure it's all cooked and decorated before they get home. I laid down with her and waited for her to fall asleep and then got up and pushed a chair up against the stove and leaning over the burners, turning the knobs off and on, and I was wearing a flannel nightgown. And back in the 60s, flannel was cased with kerosene. So that's all it wrote. A neighbor saw her through her home's front window and called the fire department. She remembers everything, including the 472 operations she has undergone over the past 52 years. Now Debbie is sharing her story in the hopes of raising funds and awareness for those who suffer from burns. Because growing up was horrible. Going through school was horrible. Teenage years were even worse because you've got all the peer pressure. And if you don't look like everybody else, you don't dress like everybody else, you're just an outcast. And we all know what happens to outcasts, you know. I always fought for what I wanted, what I got. Nothing ever came easy. Local fundraising happens through the BC Professional Firefighters Burn Fund, which offers a special camp for children who suffer from burns, and a province-wide lottery called Hometown Heroes, which raises funds for services in Vancouver, the provincial burn unit. 700 people throughout the course of the year, that's quite a significant number. So we're trying to educate people and prevent these but also for the, for the 700 people that have to go through this, we're trying to make sure there's programs and, and care available to them. Debbie has worked hard to overcome her scars and still faces adversity today. Debbie believes her life was saved over 50 years ago so she could help others survive and thrive just like she has. Tickets for the Hometown Heroes Lottery are available online and at London Drugs. Katherine Hansen, CKPG News. We hear now from another local woman who's sharing her story. And when you think of seniors in sports, you probably think of low impact or slower velocity activities. Dave Branco met up with one woman who prefers the diving board. Virginia Hoover has always loved the feeling of flying since the age of 12. Now, 77, Virginia is still launching herself from platforms and into water. All my life, whenever I got a chance to go to a pool, I would just dive in and climb out, dive in and climb out. I wasn't interested in swimming across lengths or anything like that. That would just be a chore. Virginia lives in the village of Telqua. Once a month, she drives over four and a half hours to the nearest diving tower, located in Prince George. 
Well, there is a dive I would still like to learn, but it's unlikely I will now. I'm at the stage where I'm having to give up some of my dives because I don't have the, the push to get high enough off the boards anymore. In the sport of diving, one of the goals is to avoid the big splash when entering the water. However, when Virginia begins to climb the dive tower, she is known to draw some attention. I notice that when we go to leave, is when I really notice who's been watching and whatnot. That there are people standing up on the hot tub that have been watching apparently the entire time, and people along the bulkheads and whatnot. Yeah, so, but I don't notice it right away. I'm amazed by her sometimes, and sometimes I think I don't know what it, you know possesses her to go and do that. Staying active in your older years can improve your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. For Virginia Hoover, when it comes to staying fit, she dives right in. Dave Branco, CKPG News. The Maker Lab at the Two Rivers Art Gallery was home to a master carver over the summer. Catherine Hansen has more on what he crafted up. Hours of painstaking and precise work has gone into Leonard Paquette's latest creation. The Aboriginal artist in residence at the Two Rivers Art Gallery is close to finishing this totem pole. He can be seen most weekdays focusing on his craft. I'm in the spiritual world. I walk softly in it. And I, you know, I, I, I love my work. It's the most important thing in my life, besides my daughter and my son. Leonard has been using the Maker Lab as his workspace since 2015, and his presence has been mutually beneficial to the art gallery. Leonard has a spot to work, and he can work on some really big projects that would be hard to work on at home. And then at the same time, the public gets to engage with him. Tourists love Leonard. He can tell lots of stories. Um, he's always working with the kids in the camps. He's a mentor for our Maker Lab Youth Immersion Program for the teens. Well, it's not hard work, it's just, uh, you have to learn it. He learned his skills in jail 45 years ago and has since used Indigenous art to connect and teach anyone willing to learn about it. He can often be found leading workshops with students teaching beading and other skills. We're learning about his practice and how he, he forms a piece of wood transforms it, does a rough carving, and how we can appreciate how long it takes and the work that goes into it and the dedication he has to his craft. Gotta be really careful with, this, with the chisel because I could break these out. For Leonard, each piece he works on is special and unique and holds a piece of the artist himself. He figures he has spent over a thousand hours on this yellow cedar pole, which will soon be shipped to a buyer in Toronto. <laughs> My spirit goes with it. My 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 um my spirituality. And so when I finish telling the story, well, that's part of me too. It's not just a, a story. It's part of me. It's what I incorporate with my, in my um, in my art. Catherine Hansen, CKPG News. A new TV series was filmed in Prince George and premiered at the end of September. Local talent and shops were featured, and the creators of the series say they couldn't have done it without them. Good news, Jeff. You're fired. No! Jeff and the Ninja is a Prince George-based TV show about a young man desperate to find a roommate. Hi, I'm the Ninja. His prayers are answered when a ninja appears at the door and a unique friendship is formed. The series will be shown to the public for the first time at the Prince George Playhouse on September 29th. The director says they chose to release the first six episodes at the Playhouse as a thank you to the city for all their help in filming. People kind of bend backwards for us here, so we were able to pull off a lot of things here that we wouldn't be able to do in a bigger centre. And there's been a lot of times where I've had producers, they're like, oh, well, you know what, if you moved to Vancouver, you'd, be, you'd already be making movies and all this stuff. And I'm kind of like, well, honestly, I think a big part of the reason why we're doing so good and why we're beating out some of those bigger productions with more money is because we're doing it in Prince George. The first six episodes took roughly nine months to film, and that excludes all the preparation like hiring cast members. Many of the characters were hired locally, and some had never acted before. 
Dominic Tuvi, who plays one of the main bad guys, says for his first acting job, it was a lot more work than he thought. I had to grow up my beard. I had to learn to eat my mustache. <laughs> um, I had to try to just add a little bit more size than normal. Um, kind of changed my whole lifestyle for this role. Different scenes in the show feature places around the city like Twisted Cork, Danny's Woodworking, and BX Pub. As the creators get excited to make the second half of the series, they already have a few locations in mind. We actually have another six episodes that are already written and ready to go. Um, and the big finale of our first season actually takes place in a stadium like this. So part of the reason I want to stand here is so people see me here and then maybe they'll let us do it when the time comes. TELUS OPTIC gave this show the grant it needed and will air the first series early this fall. It will also be available on the StoryHive YouTube channel for those who aren't subscribed to TELUS. Olivia McDonald, CKPG News. Coming up next on Northern BC Moments, a local family shares their love for Halloween and we share a song that generated a lot of attention on our Facebook page. Traditions are a big part of why so many people love Halloween. Many families carve pumpkins, go trick-or-treating, or simply hand out candy together. But there's one family that takes it a step further. Their house is transformed into a spooky display for weeks, and it's a labor of love that keeps them going. <laughs> Believe it or not, but this is actually a scaled-back display for the Coletti family. This year is a little bit shorter, just the beginning of the month I was busy, so I didn't have as much time. Kind of got cut down to 15 days instead of 30. Yep, that's right. Hundreds of skeletons, pumpkins, and ghosts have been popping up on their front yard piece by piece over the last three weeks. It's such a big job that Spencer moved back home for the month to work on the project. It's really fun. Like the night of Halloween, you have a ton of kids. It's noticeable how many more kids come here than every other house. We'll get up to two, three, four hundred kids in a night, which is pretty awesome being a bit farther out of town. Um, and there's so much grinning and happy kids everywhere just having a blast. Located just off North Nechaco, the house has become a neighborhood attraction. People from all over town stop to check out just what the Colettis will do next. It's something they're thinking about all year long. You know, it's something that you just think about forever. I mean, my son, he got into it some years back and he's really quite uh, inventive. And he has, uh, he's been the one who's kind of put the ideas together. But I mean, we, when we really start this, we don't even have a plan. Like I was talking to him the other day and he says, when I'm doing this, Dad, I'm, I'm thinking four feet ahead of me and I'm just doing it. And we've done so many different things. It's, I don't know, it's an ongoing process. This has been a family tradition for the Colettis for about 20 years and everyone gets involved to help create these bone chilling scenes. No matter who you ask, they'll all tell you the same reason why they do it. Just having to see everyone coming from all around just to see it, that's pretty cool. These ghosts and ghouls will come down tomorrow and with that, they'll start working on their Christmas display. Kendall Robertson, CKPG News. Like many of us in BC, 87-year-old Clarence Boudreaux was fed up with the wildfire smoke this season. It kept him inside for several weeks, and while sticking with a sense of humor, he decided to write a song about it. We leave you now with the sounds of Mr. Boudreaux. Thank you so much for watching Northern BC Moments. Holy smoke, holy smoke, it's no longer a joke while we're Still saying that's all hope for rain. We must evacuate before it's too late. If the fires don't slow, there'll be no place to go. If we can't have rain. Please send us some snow. You've turned day to night. Please send us some light. Holy smoke, holy smoke. It sure does get your gold. When the sky turns red, you feel you're half dead. 
Please don't take my sunshine away. 